Rebecca Sherm, I love that cover, is the author of the novel There's a House Between Earth and the Moon and Unbecoming. She lives in Palo Alto, California. Take it away, Rebecca. Hi there. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm here reading uh, from A House Between Earth and the Moon, which takes place in 2033. Um, and it's about a group of mostly ordinary scientists who are the first inhabitants of a residential luxury space station that was built as a bolt hole for billionaires. Um, the space station is funded by a telecom giant called Census, who is putting our phones into our ears and shortening the distance between us and our technology. Um, and the excerpts that I'm going to read today um, this is when one of the last of the um, newcomers comes to Parallaxis, which is the name of the space station, or rather when she's recruited for it. Um, her name is Tess, and she is a young social psychologist. And the piece I'm going to read is from chapter three. And uh, this is when Tess is recruited to Census. Tess expected to hear from Census someday. She knew they would want her, and she looked forward to turning them down. She was a research scientist at Caltech now, and her first study there on how a group of six-year-old children agreed to include or exclude a newcomer to a game had gotten some attention. Her methods, tracking the eye movements of the children as they checked each other for agreement and discord, had gotten more. When Census finally called her, the recruiter wouldn't say what the project was. Tess resisted his first two attempts, and then he alluded to a human data set that he was certain would interest her specifically if she were willing to come in to discuss it in person. Tess's heartbeat sped up and those familiar prickles stung her palms. For a human data set to be enticing, rich for discovery, the fact that it existed at all had to be uncomfortable, even a little wrong. You could know in your heart it should not exist, but it made that same heart beat a little faster. Tess took the meeting, she didn't tell anyone. The morning of her appointment, Tess fussed over her appearance. She tucked her short, dark ear, hair behind her ears, and then her ears were sticking out like an elf. She stared at the pimple in the middle of her chin, so large it seemed to have an areola, annoyed that she suddenly cared about it. They wanted her. She was just taking a meeting. But whomever she was meeting today, fuck them already for making her worry about how she looked. The census recruiter was older than she was, somewhere in his 30s. Hard to tell with skin that nice. As he led Tess across the census campus, her phone stopped working. Her dashboard was gone. All she saw was the back of the recruiter, the paths in front of her, the low black buildings surrounding them. Tess hadn't been without her dashboard in eight years. Even her dreams had a dashboard. The only sounds she could hear were outside her, her clogs clomping down the path beside, behind the recruiter, a distant door sliding open and closed. She had entered, for the very first time, a private space. What level is this? She asked. Privacy, I mean? Our people start at V and go up from there, he said. The whole campus is X, though. She wanted to ask him what level he had, but it seemed rude in this context, like asking him how important he was. He smiled. Enjoy the quiet, he said. He left her in a small meeting room furnished with just two chairs and a round table between them. Ten minutes passed before the door opened again. The woman who came in was holding two mugs of tea. She was fine-lined and a little plump, wearing glasses and a faded navy blue sweater that showed the thick straps of her sports bra. Her black hair was in a sloppy ponytail, the home kind of ponytail that people made without realizing it. She didn't look like someone who could work at census. Oh, thank you, Tess said when the woman handed her the mug of tea. Could you tell me who I'm waiting for? You're waiting for me the woman said, sitting down across from Tess. I'm Catherine Song. Tess's face must have betrayed her surprise because the woman smiled in what Tess would soon understand with satisfaction. I know you didn't expect to meet me and you didn't think I'd look like I do. I don't know what you look like, Tess said without thinking. No one does. 42, Korean American, this was the only public information about Catherine Song's appearance. My sister is the face of our company, Catherine Song said and the voice. She laughed, a soft huff that seemed to Tess, both genuine and practiced, routine. I never think about it at all, don't have to. 
She glanced down at Tessa's pimple, which had been poked and squeezed into new prominence only an hour earlier. Can you imagine the freedom? It's power, she said, lightly pressing her fingertips onto the glass table to transcend, bypass image entirely. No one knows what you look like, Tess asked. Sure they do while they're with me, she said. You do right now, and you'll have your biological memory, but you can't carry my image with you, no. Is that because you're privatized? Tess asked. I didn't think privatized people were exempt from... <laughs> no, tons of people are privatized. I'm something else, but I'm not why you came today, am I? Tess blushed. No, that's good. That's how I like it. You're here because you want to know about views. Census phones recorded and archived everything a user saw. Census had each and every user's life exactly, exactly as lived in its possession, their views. The time had come to examine those lives, to process them. Tess wasn't surprised. Views or something like it had been a sci-fi fantasy or nightmare in the public imagination for as long as she could remember. The idea that everyone might be spied upon by someone else, someone or something more powerful to influence you, protect you, control you. When she was a kid, her parents had placed stickers over their laptop cameras and whispered to hide from their virtual assistants. But listening to and looking at census users was nothing new. What Catherine Son described was something different, looking through. These are the core of human individuality, Catherine said. Look around you right now. How much can I learn about you from what and who is in your field of vision right this second? How much more can I learn by watching what your eye lingers on, what you notice or don't in your own environment? That's views. All that you see from your own eyes, the unique way that you see it, how you see it, who you are. What do you want me for? Tess asked, even though she knew. At this point, we've got 700 beta algorithms working together to process views and interpret them. My team has gotten to where the algo can predict the most obvious user choices. It's about as smart as your average five-year-old. Five-year-olds can predict a lot, Tess said. They can make a deal. They know you're not going to keep a promise if you haven't kept it before. Yeah, said Catherine. But the algo should know whether you're going to follow through, and if you even mean to, before you know. The first time. Do you see? I'm going to stop there. Um, I don't think I'm spoiling too much to say that the human data set that is proposed to Tess is um, too much for her to resist. And she becomes ensnared <laughs> in this experiment herself. Mm -hmm.